All right, we will give it a couple more minutes to see if anyone else will join and then we will get started. Um, for those attending, if you could just remain on mute throughout the presentation as well as cameras off and we will get started just momentarily. Okay, um, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so for those of you that don't know, my name is Kelly and I am the admissions director here at Otega University. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight for our dev meet. Um, just as a reminder for those who have just joined, um, please keep your uh, microphones on mute and your cameras off during the presentation. Um, we want to um, just welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to be talking tonight um, with our instructor, Terry Roberts, as well as a Bottega alumni, Nicholas Forshi. Um, and they are going to be talking about how to find and where to start building out web applications. Um, so Terry, if you would like to go ahead and um, take the floor and present your presentation to us tonight. Absolutely. So hello, everyone. Terry, if you don't know me one of the instructors here at Bottega. I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys some of the, uh, well, some, some of the reasons that I find UML important and why I believe we should also spend an equal amount of time preparing and designing our applications as we do coding them. And sometimes maybe even more, right? So everyone can see the PowerPoint, right? Okay, perfect. So here we go. Tips on how to find where to start building your application. Um, let me go ahead and click on that there. So why planning our applications is so important. So the first thing I want to say about that is really, it's got to be one of the most prioritized parts of your development process, because for one, it's going to be one of the key parts that keeps you from having so much trouble throughout the whole process. Oh, oops, sorry, thought I thought I heard someone right there. So it's going to keep you ba basically from having problems throughout the whole process. I want to go through some of the pros that we have on that. So right here, we have benefits of UML diagrams. And that is like, you know, planning out class diagrams, activity diagrams, your deployment diagrams, your overall processes on how your, your application is going to function. And then you also have your front end preparing, like UX, UI planning. Um, what are your user stories? What's the prime objective, the key purpose of your application, what you're trying to do for the user, for instance, the service. Um, it also, it's going to help you pinpoint a starting, um, like a starting point in your application, meaning you're going to have a lot more idea on where you should be in your application if you do a good planning process, because you're going to have multiple diagrams that are going to be what I like to say right here, provides a visual roadmap, for instance. Because a lot, I mean, at least for me, for instance, right? Whenever I'm trying to create a program, if I'm just going off the top of my head, it's really hard to remember every single part of like 
every single function that I want it to have, especially with someone like me, right? Now, my I have like that ADHD type brain where my brain will jump from subject to subject to subject. And in coding, that can be a little bit problematic because if you're trying to stay on track and you're trying to solve one particular bug, you need something to help you keep on track. So that's what this is going to be, your visual roadmap. One of the best things about having that roadmap actually leads directly into the next um, bullet point I have here. It helps you locate bugs and other potential issues that may occur during the development process before they happen. So if you think throughout your whole process, you have diagrams showing you where you need to go next, that's going to give you an idea. Okay, these are some potential problems I might have if I'm building this type of class and I'm trying to, to attach it to a, maybe a different part of your project, right? You're going to get to see how it's connected to the other part of your project, all of the pieces of key data that's inside of that project. And that's going to give you a better idea of, okay, what should I make sure that this class has so that it will work over here? And it gives you a really good idea there. Now, this next part is kind of key to the UX UI part. So not everything is going to be classes and programming language, right? It's always going to be, sometimes it's just the experience that you want your user to have. So along with those user stories, those feature lists and the prime objective, those right there kind of give you exactly what your user needs. So if you go and you use what is like a site map, right? Or a wireframe, even though it might not be functionality wise and giving you pieces of data, it does give you the buttons, the elements, the key parts of your UI that you need to have to access things that might be like logging in. So definitely, definitely do all of these you see here. Presentation. Now, that is the pros. There's actually a lot of pros that go into that. One I actually failed to mention here was helps the team understand the entire, I'm sorry, helps the entire team understand the goal. So with that visual roadmap that you provide by thinking through the whole process, your whole team is going to be able to chime in with, hey, here's a couple of bugs we might encounter when we're doing this process. Not, not only that, it's not only just your roadmap. If you're confused or your teammates confused, you guys might be able to go to this, any of the diagrams that you've created and be able to figure out exactly what his problem might be, what you might be missing together. It's something that helps tie your team together and helps you guys all design part of the process. So there's a lot of key pros to that. And which leads me into my cons to thinking out your process. There are no cons to thinking out your process ever, ever. The more thought you put into your program, the better your program is going to be. Now, of course, as any of us developers will say, yes, you can overthink, but this actually helps you not do that because you're spending less time confusing yourself with logic and just being able to read logic that you've already figured out. Instead of you thinking of the whole puzzle piece, you have it there and you can just choose one part of that puzzle piece to work on. And you do that enough times and then you have the whole puzzle. So there is no, there are no cons to that. Now, the next thing I said here is what do I mean by a roadmap? I've kind of explained that a little bit already, but just to dive a bit more into it, it says, do we really need to develop one for our, for our applications? Well, absolutely. For the reasons that I've already stated, it's going to keep you on track. If anything else, it's going to keep you from knowing, one, what your starting point is, and two, what your main goal at the very end is. So that roadmap is going to be every single thing in between that point. So yes, that's what I mean by roadmap. But we're going to end up showing you a little bit one here. Let's see. So here's one right here. So building out the UX UI, right? Coming up with that prime objective. The reason that you even want to create your application. If you don't know why you're creating your application, it's going to be hard to come up with logic to complete the application, right? You're, got, you're not going to have any idea what's... What you need? Do you need to sign in? Do you need to have animations in some particular thing? Do you need a database? Most likely, right? What kind of database do you want to use? All of that is key information that you need to know when going and building your app. You know, do you want to build your API in Flask? Do you want to build it with Node.js? Of course, these are things that are helpful when you're talking to your team as well, because you're going to be building this roadmap together. But here are some key features like 
using the user stories. Now, I know we all go over user stories and sometimes we think, okay, we, we pass this user story super fast, not a big deal. But you, I mean, I can give you an example, right? Of a, of a user story and you can have, okay, let's just think about it, right? Um, let's come up with a, a user story right here and we can just right off the top of our head. So we have user um, clicks on search bar, types in flowers, clicks enter. Right there alone, those three sentences, we already have a search bar, we need to have a functionality for clicking and searching, and then we need to have a button that actually fires the response and goes search for those items. So those are three key features that we need to make that functionality work. And that was just from a user story. And that was one part of our application. Imagine if you do that for every single part. Now, the same thing is gonna go with the wireframes and sitemaps because these user stories are gonna give you a mental representation of what your application needs to do. And then these wireframes and sitemaps are gonna draw out that mental representation. Later, you can go and make it look pretty, but that's after you've already gone and maybe created a, a bit of the functionality where there's a skeleton there. Now, I wanna say that making sure you plan out everything may take some extra time, but it will continue to help you in the development process because you're gonna keep coming back to it over and over and over again. So I know that it might take a little extra time, might seem boring in comparison to solving computer logic and making you feel super nerd. I get it, trust me, but it's useful. Um, the next thing I'm gonna show you is just a couple of tools that you can actually use to help. So like Lucidchart is a good one. That is gonna help you where you can go and build your uh, like diagrams like this, where for instance, I actually wanna talk about this for a second. You guys will of course, when you're building out your own applications, come across your own deployment diagrams because you'll craft your own or maybe you're reading it from other developers. But what's cool about like something like a deployment diagram, we can make our own little roadmap from this, right? So we go, we come up with how we want the whole application to work, maybe the, the overall deployment. And then we can go, to the front end specifically, and now we can do a class diagram for just the front end, right? What are the bits and pieces of just the front end? What is it gonna talk to? Each one of these colored boxes can have their own set of diagrams, own set of thought process, thought out, making your life easier. So you spend that extra time doing it before you code, again, gonna save a lot of time. And like I said here, it doesn't have to look fancy. It does need to be descriptive so that you know what's going on, but it doesn't have to be hours worth of making it look good. You know, you don't have to be a graphic designer. It just needs to explain your coding story in a way. Um, Microsoft Paint, I'm gonna also throw these other ones out there actually, because I just noticed this one. Microsoft Paint, I know everyone has it and it's not something like this. It's gonna allow you to connect all the boxes and everything. But like I said, it doesn't have to be fancy. So as long as you can draw and it gives you the idea, it doesn't matter what program you use. So I personally like diagrams.net. It's free. It connects to your Google Cloud. So you can basically store as many as you need and you can share it really easy. So I really like that one. Um, let's see. So that's a couple other ones. And then Envision, we can go ahead and go over that one. That one is paid. Um, after a few diagrams, but it's very in-depth. So if you guys like graphic design and you want to be a UX UI guy or, um, or woman, wh wh whichever, you can go ahead and use that one. You can do a lot of cool stuff with that, even animating. So let's pop into the last one here. So um, now that's a few reasons why I believe that UML, basically the entire development process, thinking it all out is super important. So I just want to make sure that we're all doing this for our own applications. And you're going to thank yourself whenever you're done. And your team is absolutely going to thank you because they're going to know not just where, what you're trying to do, but what your thought process is. And they'll be able to wrap their thought process around yours much easier. Um, do y'all have any questions for me about anything that I've gone over in like specifically? Eric, did you have a question? 
Well, he asked. I forgot about the, uh, the the chat. Okay, there we go. Okay, Eric, what was your question? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, so for a user story, that is when essentially you write down or you can say it like I did, right? I like to write it down. That way I can go back over it. But it's essentially describing a user's experience on your application. It's probably the best way of saying it. So you can imagine if you wanted to create, let's say like a e-commerce website, right? And you wanted to think about how your buttons and your whole, um, like maybe your gallery that shows your, um, your items, how they should be looking. Well, maybe you want to decide if it feels better on the right or left, right? Well, you can come up with multiple stories that are detailed on exactly what the um, user's doing on your application that'll let you like draw, a, I like to call it like a mental image of how your application looks. So like, does it feel better with the buttons on the right, on the left? And then you know what elements should or should not be there based off the story. Hope that was descriptive for you. <laughs> and no problem, man. And what is UML, UX, UI? So, oh, sorry, you're right. I did say UX, UX. That was actually a typo. Sorry about that. But um, that should say UX, UI. And that's for user experience and user, um, sorry, user interface. So basically what your users interacting with, your front end, right? Um, every website like Facebook, when you're interacting with it, that's their user experience and their UI. And then UML, that is like thinking out your process using different diagrams like class diagrams, activity diagrams, um, deployment diagrams. Now, it, you might not have hit it just yet in the course, depending on where you are, but it, we do go very in-depth in it in the content. So I highly recommend spending some time in that section. I know sometimes it feels like a step back because you're not coding, but I promise it's very important. And yes, Samina. Sorry, um, okay. is there a specific type of diagram that you would uh, recommend using? Um, just kind of like a blanket UML? Um, I know there's just so many different types, but is there one that you just kind of pull towards and then you can kind of branch off from there? Yes, definitely. Um, and I think our other instructor, Alex, would agree with me on this one, the class and activity diagram. I find myself going to those ones a lot just because they're super descriptive and they, the class is probably the one I use more than anything, just because, you know, everything is object oriented. So understanding what kind of functions, what is the multiplicity of what's going to be connected to what, all of that's super important, no matter what. So that's probably my go-to. Okay. Is there a specific, um, is there one that you wouldn't recommend using or one that you don't use very often? Uh, well, there's a few, I mean, admittingly, there's a few I don't use as often off the top of my head. I don't really know which ones those are because I don't use them often. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's um, all right. but I mean, to answer your first question, no, there's not any that I don't recommend. I mean, any bit of thought process, any new um, diagram you add to like your roadmap is going to be beneficial in some form or fashion. Okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep, good question. Um, Harry, I have a few questions here too. Um, how can a junior developer get better at the planning projects and what suggestions do you have for getting better at those? Okay, good question. I would say Code Wars for one. And the reason I say that is because even though it's not necessarily building out full-scale applications, it's not about you being able to figure out how to build a full-stack application. The, the skill is being able to break a huge puzzle into tiny pieces. So that's, that's what it means to think out your process, right? So going to Code Wars, that's going to allow you to have tons of random challenges. Some of them are super hard, some are super easy, but each one's going to be different. And you take that question, you basically break what they're asking you into pieces, right? You pseudo code that. Learn the process of breaking a big piece into a small piece so that you're not confused by a thousand things you have to do. Instead, you're only focused on one thing you have to do. And that is mostly like the key of all of UML, in my opinion. It's just taking a big photo of everything and making it really small so that you can focus on one particular thing that's going to build into the whole thing. 
So go to Code Wars. Um, make sure you're practicing on that because, again, even if you don't solve the problem, it's all about pseudo coding, honestly, which helps you in so many aspects of coding. And then also, whenever you start a program, I, I would say first start with that prime objective. You have to figure out what the purpose of it is. And once you have that purpose, go through, do the user stories, because that's going to, again, give you things that your website for sure has to have on its, like for the user to interact with. And based off those interactions, you'll know what kind of functionality you might have to plan into it. Like, and I'll give you an example of that. If you have a user story where they log in, you know, there's a button and you know that right there, if they're logging in, you have an API, what kind of data are they taking in? A username and a pass um, and a password. So there alone, you know you have a back-end process that now you can draw out. You also have to be able to create a user class for them to even send the request in general, right? So now you know that you can use a class diagram in your front end to draw out what your user's properties and methods, what can it do? Every part of programming builds off of itself. And so you just have to make sure that you can pinpoint where you can break off and start a new process of thought so that you can cover everything. Thank you, Terry. Um, next question is, is there anything, is there any such thing as taking too much time in the planning phase? Yes and no. I would say if you're taking too much time because you're kind of nervous to start and you don't like, you're nervous to get started on the program and like worried about messing it up and that you're doing it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Because the best thing about programming is that there's not a right way to do it. So if you get in there, you get your hands dirty and it breaks something, well, you're just doing your job by getting it fixed. You're just making yourself a better programmer by going in there, practicing and breaking it, right? So if the only reason you haven't started and you're still thinking about UML stuff and the pre-process about, sorry, the pre-development process is because you're nervous about starting the development process, yeah, that's bad. But if you're taking more time because you think that there's genuinely more information that you can nail down and figure out before you start coding, then no, there's not, a, there's not too much time you can take on that. Um, and the last question is in regards to capstone projects. Um, so if a student is feeling stuck or they need additional assistance, how can they reach out for help? Well, there's actually a couple of ways. So we have the mentors, of course. So they're available all the time. So you got to send them out a message on the support app. Or if you want to speak to an instructor from two o'clock PM mountain center time to four, there's an open zoom session where me and Alex are both available. Well, where either me or Alex are available to answer questions. And of course, if, if they ever need assistance, feel free to call me, Alex. Um, but they're saying that. Um, so that is probably a really good way. If you have some free time during your day and you want to get some questions answered, it doesn't matter if you're at the beginning of the course or you're at the end of the course and you, or you just want to ask questions about programming. That would be the time to do it. Um, or you can, of course, again, reach out to the mentors and if they need more assistance, they can reach out to us. Okay, okay. thank you. And mm -hmm. um, Tiffany, uh, your question is if this meeting is for UX UI or programming. Um, so essentially today's webinar is just talking about where to start and how to plan out um, projects efficiently. And just so you, I would say that UX, UI, all that stuff is programming. It is. All of it in self, I mean, sorry, everything that you learn is programming. Programming is more than writing code. You're, you're a computer scientist, essentially, right? You're learning computer science. So when you program something what you're doing with UML is you're programming your brain to understand the entire process. You're just not physically writing code. That's the only difference. Great questions. Are there any other questions for Terry? Tara had one in the chat. You said you had one in the chat? Let me see. So basically, I think I've confused myself with the way it, I think I've confused myself with the question <laughs> on how that, 
I guess I'm a little bit confused on what you're asking exactly. Um, that was Kier Turpin. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm asking because um, I did debate and I'm trying to relate basically what you're talking about and like just something that I've done before. So like okay. in preparing for as, as an informative speech, you had to like lay out details to guide your people or, or the audience that you wanted to follow along. So that's basically what you're explaining as in with computer programming and coding is you're basically doing a roadmap except it's allowing more user actual interaction than just sitting there and listening is basically what you're saying. Yes, I would agree okay. to that. All right, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Good question. Always great to relate things that you've done before to program. It makes it easier. Any other questions for me? Please, not all of you at once. <laughs> all right. Excellent job, Terry. Thank you so much for um, joining us tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Thank I'm you, excited. Terry. You're welcome. Um, next, we are going to um, talk to our alumni spotlight tonight. Um, that would be Nicholas Forshee. So he went through our program here um, for the full stack development certificate program. And he is going to be talking to us about capstone project and introduction, you know, introducing that you to that. So uh, Nicholas, if you're ready, I will turn over the time to you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Great to see you, Terry. Uh, glad to see that you're doing well. Still got those jokes in you. Yeah. Never stops, man. Good never stops. You get the boo. <clears throat> All Hold right. You, <laughs> I'm going to steal the screen share for just a second. Am I wrong? Not, not really. You're not wrong. What the hell does not really mean? Uh, Terry, can I grab the screen share from you? <clears throat> Mom, go back downstairs. You don't even know who you're talking about. All right. <clears throat> so, in a. <clears throat> My job tonight is going to be talk to you guys about a practical approach on what Terry's um, elaborated on with the UI UX design, as well as practical tips on how to kind of get started. Um, I assume that most of us, if not all of us in this room, are either in the program, going to be in the program, or have recently finished the program. And part of that program is going to be a capstone, which is a website, full front end, back end, API, database. Um, designed to really test yourself and to show what you've learned and how to really create your, your website of your own. Um, for my project, as you can see on the screen, I assume you can see it on the screen, um, <clears throat> I did a Sudoku board where um, it will actually load a board for you. It's fully playable, gives you a timer. It will tell you if you could put something in the wrong space or if you could put something in the right space. Uh, let's see that. Yeah. So right would just show up like this. Uh, once you've solved the board, everything goes green. <clears throat> you can enter old board numbers. This is board number 180. I could go back to board number five if I wanted and replay that one. Um, but <clears throat> where do you go? How do you start? What do you do? Um, there is such a, there's such a, almost like a, a cliff where you finally get to the edge with this idea of this is what I'd like to do for my project or my website or my capstone, but how do I start? Where do I go? And for that, um, I'd like to take you into the role that I'm currently working as. I have been hired on as the lead support developer at a company called Ascent Software Group. A little bit of context for the company. Um, back in 2008, when the housing market crashed, Congress passed a law that basically said <clears throat> that mortgage loan officers are no longer allowed by law to know who is doing the inspections of the home for the appraisal. So it created this large um, gap in, in the market where now you have these two people that don't know who each other are. And so that's what Ascent does is our software facil facilitates the appraisal process from start to end. And basically a new order will come in, 
the appraisal management company who utilizes our software will reach out to an appraiser, get it booked, the appraisal will be done, all of the information will be uploaded into the software, and then the reports will be sent out, the compliance stuff will go to the government, the fees will be paid, all of that kind of stuff. So that's a little bit of context for it. And just to show you, um, this Sudoku board that I'm playing right now has about four or five different components that work together. You've got the game board, you've got the home page, you have the navigation, this little instructions modal, <clears throat> four or five different things all simultaneously working together on the front end, as well as the game board generation on the back end. Well, in the current project that I'm working on, the software that we develop, uh, at any given time, there are up to 750 different endpoints and components that are working together to create the software. <clears throat> and so coming in as a junior developer, fresh out of Bottega, wasn't even a month since I graduated. It was a real challenge to understand where I fit and where my place was and how to begin. They have this extremely developed, um, vibrant, enormous program. How do I begin? And just like Terry said, I'll show you kind of our process here. We break things down. We break things down into stories, into individual tasks, and we utilize this pre-planning phase in order to facilitate the change. So this was a, a task that I did just a couple, of, about a week ago, um, this allow reverting a canceled order to a previous status. And I wanted to show you that even in the real world, in, in the workplace, you're still using the same kind of stuff. Here's our user story. We always start it with the same six words, as a, I want so that. So as an appraisal management company user, I want to revert a canceled order back to its previous state so that the order can be reactivated in our software. And what's cool about that is you can do this UI UX planning on both a, on, a, on a macro scale with the entire application, just like I would have done for this capstone, or you could do it as something as simple as one task or one assignment, or even in this case, this is one button that I've created that calls a new endpoint on the back end that does a lot of functionality and returns a little bit to the front end, and that's it. But we had to do all of this planning for one button. And just like uh, Terry said, after you've kind of planned yourself out, sometimes we use actual like mapped wireframes and um, the different diagrams. Sometimes we just do it in words. But after that, take the time to actually pseudo code everything out. Instead of like diving right in and actually playing with the JavaScript or the Python or whatever you're using, put a little bit of effort into just a base thing. So in this, uh, we use Vue. I know that uh, we learned React in the in the course, but um, I'm currently using Vue.js. So in this order actions component setup function, we're going to create this constant. It's going to be, this is a Vue term. And then we're going to create this function that does some stuff. It opens a dialogue. It requires an entry for a reason. It calls this endpoint, queries a database table, creates notes, returns it back to the, the front end. And all of that effort and all of that design is so important that in, in my job, we, we do everything in these two-week little increments called sprints. And the first three days of the sprint, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, are all devoted to UI, UX, planning. And then Thursday, we actually start into the code. Um, I unfortunately can't show you um, the program that I'm working on, the, the website. It's quite proprietary and I'd get in a lot of trouble. But <clears throat> I can show you kind of the process on what it would be like to start a capstone from fresh. So <clears throat> when I first started this project back in, oh, what would have been like October? <clears throat> um, I had no idea even what to do, what to choose. I was browsing some YouTube videos one day. And I was able to, I found this guy named Tech with Tim. Maybe some of you have heard of his channel, but he was giving some ideas on basic programming exercises and how to utilize them on resumes. And one of his that he created was he recreated Tetris. And I was like, oh, Tetris sounds a little difficult. What other games could I practice? And then I thought to myself, oh, I love to play Sudoku in my previous career. Um, I played Sudoku all the time on off times. 
And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to try it. So I thought to myself, all right, how, how am I going to go about this? <clears throat> and luckily, Terry really drilled it into us that taking the time to create the diagrams, create the stories, create the roadmap of where you want to go, really, really helped to get a finished project. Now, it's never going to be perfect. Just because you have a roadmap doesn't mean it's going to be bug free or just because you have bugs doesn't mean it's going to require extra effort and logic, but it at least gets you pointed in the right direction to know where you're going to go. For instance, on the Sudoku board, <clears throat> I probably redesigned this thing 50 times before I actually brought it out onto the, into the code, because you have to think about everything. Some of the things that you wouldn't even think of is, okay, what do I want to do with these buttons? In, in my case, I click on this button and then I'm able to put that number wherever I want into the application. Some people, um, a lot of my friends, when I was showing them to this, they said, oh, I'd rather do it the other way where I would click on a square and then click on the button. Those are all decisions that you have to make. And until you have at least thought about it or planned it out, you don't know what those decisions are gonna come to until you actually get there in the code. And if you get there in the code, now you've got like a, like a little roadblock and you're like, oh no, I've got, I've got a deadline coming up. I've, I had all this momentum and now I'm pretty blocked on what to do. And that all could have been avoided fairly easily if, um, if you had planned it out beforehand. <clears throat> so all of these decisions, all of this styling, all of this everything has to be planned out. And you can either do it before and make your life easier, or you can do it during and stay up till three in the morning, like I did several nights trying to figure some stuff out. But in the end, um, you're never done. You're never, I, I've thought of, since I completed this project, I've thought of 50 different things that I could do to improve or add to or um, enhance what I've done. Um, you should have seen oh, yeah. one of the... One of the students in our class, his name was Tristan, he made a chess game. And his chess game, we probably saw, what, Terry, 30 different versions of it before the final thing. And you could see how every stage of his development process was meticulously planned out and was, um, and it really, it really made the difference when it came to his board. It was quite fantastic. And you can really tell a difference on somebody who has taken the time to plan versus somebody who doesn't. Um, not to toot my own horn, but I was done with the capstone about a week and a half prior to the deadline. And so I was able to use that time to, oh, I don't like this color blue or, oh, this hover animation is a little bit weird. And you can kind of fine tune the stuff as you're going, as opposed to pushing the deadline when it comes a little bit closer. So it can, it can be tedious at times. It can, it can feel like um, you, the, UI, the UML, the UI UX stuff really can feel almost like tedious and repetitive because you're not actually coding. You're not actually seeing something manifest itself on the screen. But if you take the time to do it, I promise every project that you do will be way better off than if you hadn't done it. And to that point, it's so important to us that on the 28th of this month, uh, we are bringing in a dedicated UI UX UML designer at Ascent. Uh, they were hired a couple of days ago, and it is so important to us that we have a complete job title that that's all they're going to be doing that will take a little bit of the burden off us as developers, and we can share in the vision together as opposed to doing our own little thing. So it's super important. Um, I hope that the stuff that Terry talked about really hits home. And if you do it right, do it well, it really will work out in the long run. So does anybody have any questions for me? Lots of tech with Tim, tech with Tim, yeah. I do, I have one question. Yes, you sir. You that you work in two week sprints. What's the methodology for that called? Um, so we utilize, um, it's called Agile, Agile Workflow. And so we, we use every morning, we do what's called a scrum meeting. And it basically takes 20 minutes to go around the room and say, okay, yesterday I did these tasks. And today these are my priorities. 
then the next day it's yesterday I did these tasks and today we did these priorities. And so that keeps us on track individually as well as accountability to the entire team. And then we utilize different um, kind of planning days, development days. Um, we do a backlog grooming, which is where we go through about halfway through the sprint. We go back and see what we've done, see if we could approve on stuff. And then basically by the, the week two Wednesday, we are on total code free. So everything should be done. Wednesday through Friday is de dedicated to testing for the particular release that we're coming out with. And then on uh, once everything's passed through the testing Saturday morning, like super early, it's like 1.30 or 2 in the morning, um, the fresh release gets pushed live to production. I have one that goes a bit well onto that. What happens if you miss a deadline? That's a good question. So <clears throat> it honestly doesn't happen very often because we are so meticulous about the planning. Okay. But if we are to miss deadlines, um, we categorize our tasks into um, like a severity. So we have critical, high priority, medium, low, and then just like miscellaneous. And <clears throat> we always focus on the critical and high priority stuff. And then if it takes us longer than we're anticipating and the, the medium, low and miscellaneous stuff gets pushed back, it's never usually stuff that's breaking the website or um, is extremely time critical, especially on like a, um, like a compliance sort of a metric. Yeah. Um, but that kind of stuff can be pushed into the next sprint if necessary. But honestly, in the, in the six weeks that I've been there, we really haven't missed any deadlines. That's awesome, dude. Well, thank you. That's the answer to my question. Absolutely. Anybody else? Anything at all with, with the project, how like ideas, how the class was. I, I'm fresh out of this just like you guys. So I, I'm, I'm a good piece of resource. Uh, how was Sabina. the class for you? Say again? I have a question. Um, what type of UML diagrams did you use for your Sudoku website? So a lot of mine, I used a lot of class diagrams because the only, the only real component is this game board here, the, the kind of the major one. And this whole thing is just a big class and it has functionality, it has methods, it has variables. And so by using these class diagrams, I was able to really tie everything together beforehand. And sure, some things can change during the development process. If you're like, oh, I really, I thought that I needed this function, but I really don't. Or, oh, I wish I would have thought of this beforehand. Um, things can definitely change, but that's the one that helped me the most was the class diagrams. How much time were you, were you um, given to complete the capstone project? <clears throat> Pardon me, I've got this cough. Um, so I believe in the, it was two weeks from, um, I, I think it's two full weeks to do nothing but the capstone. Everything in class, you'll come to class that day and you're just working on your own individual projects. I happened to start a little bit early because I was, I was prepared enough and Terry saw that what I had, my, my idea and my vision for the website um, was clear enough that he let me start on it early. And so that's why I was done so quickly. Um, granted, I was up till two in the morning most nights working on it because I I just get super involved in the tasks that I'm doing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a solid two weeks from start to finish. I will want to add on to that. Sorry for interrupting you. Um, that your class is slightly different. So he did have a 13 week class, whereas yours is 26. So there oh, is a nice. difference. Yeah, so you're gonna, yours is gonna be a bit longer, but nice. you're gonna have enough time for the, 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 the project just like you did, I promise. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, I do have a question. Um, when it comes to, to planning the app, when you're developing the app, uh, do you focus in the front end like, from from the grown up until it's completely done and then you go to the back end or at some point do you start the back end and then work with the back end and then finish the back end 
It's a, that's a great question. That's one of the things that I actually wanted to talk about um, while I was preparing kind of my thoughts while Terry was speaking about. Um, so my recommendation, and I get this a lot from a lot of the people that I've watched online as well, is I would start after you've planned everything, front end and back end, I would start coding the front end first because there is no point in creating functionality on the back end until you have a button or a form or a something that can actually touch it. So you start off with the front end, you get a base structure. So maybe it's not all filled in with a grid. Maybe it's a big square and there's one button up here that says home. And there's another button down here that says new board. At least it's something. That way, when you push that button or start into that functionality, now you can see the request being sent from the front end to the back end, and then you can start to work with it. So I go about, this is totally made up numbers, but I would say 15% front end, then move to the back end, do like 30% back end, then move back to the front end, because now that you've developed stuff on the back end, now you have good, solid, reliable data that's being passed back to the front end. And now you can start to do stuff with it. Like the, the way that this Sudoku board works is I am generating on the back end just a big array of strings of numbers. And it's great and all when it comes back in this object that's just arrays of strings but until it actually gets put into the board, it doesn't do me any good. So it's kind of this balancing act. You kind of hop back and forth one way or the other. A database obviously is in there as well so you can actually store the data that you're working on. Um, but I would, I would definitely start with the front end and then kind of hop back and forth as you see fit. Okay, thank you. Let's see, you got a couple of questions in chat. How was the class for me when I went through it? I loved it. Uh, that is Kier's, Kier Turpin's question. I absolutely loved it. I made a very drastic career change. I, for the last five, almost five years, I was an airline pilot. I uh, decided that the time away was a little bit too much uh, to handle with my new fresh family. And so I'd like to switch into something a little bit uh, more at home <laughs> and not gone for most of the month. Uh, but it was it was a great class. Terry was a great instructor. I felt like I had all of the resources that I needed. Jordan and his videos are just awesome. Um, it really, even if you have to watch it a couple times, it really helps to narrow down the topics. And I, I had a great time. Let's see, Janet says, are there any groups for new Bottega graduates to interact? Um, as far as official ones, I'm not sure, but I keep in touch with quite a bit of my classmates uh, over, we had a Slack group, uh, we created a Discord server, uh, places for us to post new content, we follow each other on GitHub, see what everybody's doing on GitHub. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely keep in touch, uh, but I'm sure that each class on their own could come up with their own sort of group activity. Terrell says, before you attended, how computer savvy were you? Um, I, during uh, my bachelor's degree did a couple of courses in C++. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought I did pretty well. Um, it wasn't any kind of front-end stuff. It was more like kind of how your Python stuff's probably going, uh, how to create functions, how to get stuff returned from them. And um, so I, I really enjoyed it, but I, I mostly focused on the piloting thing. Jacob says, when planning your roadmap, did you have to cut some content you started with on the road to finishing your capstone? Uh, not in my case. Um, I know that some people in my class did have to because they kind of ran out of time, but I had so much time on my side that I was able to really put everything in that I wanted. Um, so additional ideas that I had thought of was um, creating like a two-player version where you could like race somebody. Um, it wouldn't be extremely difficult because I've already got all the functionality for one. I would just basically have to duplicate it and then figure out some way to like have them talk to each other. Um, but that's a, <laughs> that's a program for when I'm a lot less busy than I am now. <laughs> Eric says, how did you pick your capstone project or is it given to you? It, it should be uh, your choice on what you want to do. Some of our classmates did games. Some of mine did uh, e-commerce websites. Billy did like a, what was it? It was like a business it was management. E it I was think. his e-commerce. Yeah. 
It might have been um, business management, actually. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, so, something like that. But it's it totally varies, and it's it's kind of whatever is your comfort level and whatever intrigues you the most, and it's really cool that way because then it can be your project, and you can actually be excited about it. Mark says, "What resources helped you most with the course references, software extensions, blogs, etc.?" Uh, Jordan's videos are awesome. I after, even after class was done, I would go back through the day and rewatch the stuff that he had talked about um, because he has a really articulate way of communicating the information as well as just like uh, Terry said, Code Wars is just awesome. It's super hard at first and it's super frustrating, but it's very satisfying when you come out with the correct answer to a function. And even like you'll, you'll do the function in like 20 lines of code. You're like, yes, I finally did it. And then when you hit submit, you see somebody that did it in like one line and you're like, what? But it challenges you to be a better programmer, to make things more object oriented, more functional, and uh, to really kind of solidify the skills that you've learned. Is there a great opportunity within the IT field in Texas? I hear Texas is just booming. I'm, current, I'm here in Utah. Um, I, my work's out of Alpine, Utah, but I hear Texas, especially like the Austin area is just like crazy with the IT stuff right now. And I know Terry lives there. So yeah, just moved to Austin by the way. So, oh, hell yeah. Fun, nice. fun fact. Um, but, uh, yes, actually Texas has a lot of stuff going on. Like, um, specifically Austin, um, Tesla's moving here. So that, that's a big company that's moving. Samsung is coming here. I mean, they have like, they're saying that Austin, Texas will be like the next Silicon Valley. So if you're interested in tech and you want to be in part of the growing standard, Texas is probably the place to be. But please don't drive up my housing market. <laughs> yeah, so stay away from Utah too. That's, that's a problem. We already got into the house, so you can bring my, you can bring my value up. That's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, let's see, Terry says, all right, let's see. Daniel says, were there any parts of the class that were a little too overwhelming for you? If so, how did you get past them? You will go through times in this class and in this course and all over in the IT field where you're like, oh man, I'm just not getting it. You should have seen me day one at Ascent. There, I, I come in, I'm like, I know React and I know Python. And they're like, that's cool. Now you're going to learn Vue and you're going to learn PHP and Laravel. And I go, oh, what? Because even though things are similar and you still have functions and variables, every, the syntax is totally different and you get super big imposter syndrome, let me tell you. You walk into the place and you're like, wow, I don't know what I'm doing at all. But then you sit down and you start kind of thinking things out and you're like, okay, you know what? I, I can do this. I learned this in class. I learned that this functionality correlates to this functionality and it all kind of clicks together. And in, while you're in class and learning this stuff, just ask the questions. The, the best thing you can do all day long, ask the questions because if you move on to something, everything builds off each other. So if you move on to something and you aren't understanding the base principles, there's no way that you're gonna get the stuff that's on top because it's all just compounding. So ask the questions, take your time, put in the work and the study, 13 weeks, 26 weeks, it's really not that much time. And you can do anything for half a year. You can do anything in the world for half a year, put in the work, put in the effort, and I promise you, every single one of you can get it. Terry goes, web sockets, yes, and I uh, know nothing about them, nor do I want to right now. That was in regards to your... Uh connecting your two uh sudoku games. sudoku boards yeah yeah i know tristan was super wanting to do the web sockets but i was like dude calm down <laughs> <laughs> he's like chill bro uh, let's see I have another some... question do, do you okay. happen to have do you happen to have like a portfolio uh i did so are, are we still doing the portfolio terry that jordan yes. does yes we yeah. are uh so i have the one that you will do um jordan takes you through a portfolio um, I haven't updated it at all um, since I, I put most of my work into resume building afterwards because uh, I, I got hired on fairly quickly after Bottega was done. We finished December 7th. 7th. Yeah. And I, I started January 1st. So it, I, I really, it really wasn't that long before I got hired. Um, but 
I do have some friends out there that are still looking for some jobs. And I know that one of the best things that you can do is keep your resume updated and your portfolio updated and just start doing projects, do little websites, do little functions on code words, put everything into those portfolios that you can, because that's what employers will look like, look at for you. Uh, but yeah, you will do your own portfolio with Jordan in React. And it's actually, a, it's a pretty cool one. It looks, it looks pretty nice to me. Let's see, Jason says, as a junior developer without a degree, will obtaining a job in the industry be something that's in, within reach? That was me. I uh, don't have a degree in this field. My degree is in aviation science. So you, uh, basically gets thrown out the window. And what I've learned <coughs> uh, from basically talking to my company who is owned by a parent company who talks to a whole bunch of people in the IT field, um, if you can do the coding, they'll hire you. It is so in demand right now that if you can do it, they'll hire you. Now they are looking for people who are a good fit. One of the reasons that I did get hired, they said, was because I had a level of professional background that they thought was impressive, that I was able to conduct myself um, very meticulously. And I had a level of maturity about myself. So those are all development attributes that you can work on in your personal life that will help you. But absolutely, they, they looked at my certificate from Bottega. They said, all right, yep, let's get this guy in. So it's definitely in reach for you. And also, Jason, um, I want to let you know, too, that um, the Occupational Handbook on the Bureau of Labor Statistics website is a really great resource to be able to find um, you know, positions either within um, specific areas or locations. You can also search by um, education level. That is a really great resource that you can um, definitely check out too. Let's see. Daniel says, in your opinion, how many hours per week ballpark outside of class time do you recommend? Don't kill yourself. Put it like, put in some extra work. I, I typically, we, we were nine to five every day and I was typically coding till I don't know, 637, but like, you got to go play some video games. You got to like de-stress a little bit. You're sitting on the computer for literally like eight hours a day. It, it gets a little overwhelming at times. So put in some extra work, go through the stuff that's confusing to you, ask the questions that you need, but you're still human, like eat, sleep, breathe, all the stuff. Sean's in Austin. That's awesome. I've got a buddy of mine who is in uh, Georgetown. So I think that's pretty close to Austin. Can I get my bachelor's in computer science at Bottega after I graduate the course? Absolutely. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> one, one of the best things about Bottega is it is uh, the course is worth, what is it, 18 credits? 18 semester credit hours. Um, once completing your full stack program, you can transfer that into a associate of science in computer science or a bachelor of science in computer science business. There you go. Kelly's, Kelly's your girl if you want to talk to her about that. Ricardo says you learn concepts, not syntax. Absolutely. It's, it's all programming is the same, basically. Um, it's all conceptual. And then it just kind of differs based off of how they want it written. Another thing, since we have Miss Kelly and Miss Mary on here, is I questions about the VA. I'm sure that that is something that you could talk to them about after the workshop. Once you learn concepts, you can learn many programming languages. So true. Did you have to move for your job or were you given the opportunity to work remotely? Uh, so good question. I know a lot of people who are 100% remote. I am a hybrid model, so we are in office Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and I am at home Wednesday, Friday. And the Wednesday, Friday, those are our like super in-depth coding days. So he's like, there's no point in you coming just to sit at your desk and code. So stay home, enjoy. Um, also the stuff in the IT field has the best benefits, like great health insurance, great like PTO stuff, it's all awesome. I was searching, Dr. Lucy says, I was searching for a job for about a month. I uh, know that's not, that's a little, that can be a little fast. Um, I've seen an average of maybe one to three months, somewhere in there. I was one of the lucky ones. Uh, but yeah, people are getting jobs left and right. Josh says, Terry's the best. I totally agree. Adrian says, so if we are coming in with a different associates, does Bottega utilize those filler classes to put in associates with? That is a question for Kelly afterwards. Edwin says, does UML go hand in hand with mobile development? Absolutely. We have a guy um, who is tasked with <laughs> translating our entire 750 component, 850 endpoint front end, back end project into a mobile app. And I believe that he actually just released it as well. 
Um, so he does the same kind of stuff that we did. Um, you put in the, the planning, the management, and um, absolutely. Modu says, I'm new to the IT world and I'm barely understanding what's been said so far. So do I need to start somewhere or something? I'll start my program in August in Texas. Uh, everybody starts somewhere, you know? YouTube is a great resource. Uh, Bottega has their, uh, the, the Coding Foundations is a free course. So you can um, get into the program a little bit, see some HTML, CSS working in your favor, build a complete website. And it's a great resource. That's, I, I actually was able to do that before I started my class and I, I fell in love with it from the very beginning. Um, so there, there is resources everywhere. And that's the great thing about IT is you can take it as fast or as slow as you want to. And there's a pace for everybody and there's always work willing to match that pace. So absolutely go for it. And um, I know you can do it. Roger says, will Apple hire me as a software developer? Kind of my passion that or Google, you shoot for the stars, man. It's, you never know um, what anybody's looking for nowadays. <laughs> it's personality. It's, um, I, I'm not promising you a, a job at Apple right out of the bat. Um, they, they're looking for pretty senior people, if I'm being honest, but everybody starts somewhere and who knows where I'll be five, 10, 15 years down the road. Hopefully it's sitting pretty in Tesla and Austin. I'll come visit. And I think that's all the questions on chat, unless anybody else has anything for me. Well, thank you so much, Nicholas. I appreciate you being here with us tonight. Um, if you guys have any other further questions, um, regardless if it's about coding or if it's about um, earning your AS or your BS degree, feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to answer any of those questions for you. Um, Terry and Nicholas, thank you again so much for meeting with us tonight and the presentation. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Well, thanks for having me. Very welcome. Thank you for letting me speak. And Nick, thank you, man. Appreciate you popping in and giving us your time, dude. Absolutely. It's kind of nostalgic seeing you talk about the Sudoku. Made me feel bad. But I <laughs> <laughs> all right. You all have a good night. Bye now.